Um, first of all, greetings. My name is Dave Casey. I am the curator, uh, assistant curator of education and exhibitions here at the Minnesota Marine Art Museum. I've had the pleasure of working with Tony uh, Duran and curator of collections John Swatson um, to present and interpret Tony's work in preparing for his first uh, museum exhibition. Um, for those of you who are new to the Minnesota Mar Marine Art Museum, and I know we have people all over the country uh, uh, chiming in here today, we are a fine art museum located on the banks of the Mississippi River in Tony's hometown of Winona, Minnesota. Uh, where we, have, we focus on great art inspired by water. The mission of the Minnesota Marine Art Museum is to engage visitors in meaningful visual art experiences through education and exhibitions that explore the ongoing and historic human relationship with water. We do this through our historic collections of European and American artwork and through eight to 10 temporary exhibitions a year, which highlight contemporary artists and uh, collections on loan from other institutions. We have, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of op educational opportunities uh, for all ages as well. During the pandemic, however, a majority of those um, educational offerings have been either online or as part of take-home pro programming. And if you're curious, you can find more of that on our website um, about other opportunities we have coming up. While most of our programming has been done at a distance uh, for the last year or so, the museum is open now to visitors. Uh, masking, social distancing, and museum spacious galleries allow for a very safe experience here at the museum. Uh, we are open daily from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., but we are closed on Mondays. Um, we are here to talk with uh, photographer Tony Duran, whose exhibition California is currently on display at the museum through April 25th. Tony is an award-winning commercial fashion, fashion, celebrity portrait, and architectural photographer. Uh, this Winona, Minnesota-born artist spent many years working freelance all over the world and has lived in Los Angeles, California for the last two decades. His break into fame occurred when he photographed musician Jennifer Lopez, which subsequently led him to photograph leading celebrities in the music, fashion, film, and television industries. His works have appeared on hundreds of magazine covers world, uh, worldwide. On display in the exhibition are portraits of Jennifer Lopez, Beyonce, Tom Cruise, Sandra Bullock, Sharon Stone, Jane Fonda, and dozens more on the beaches and in the pools and baths of California. As you can see, I'm sitting here in the exhibition, uh, in the exhibition gallery. If you have not yet made it into the, uh, into the museum, um, we do have everything that's in, in the exhibition, all the images, all the texts, all the video um, is available on our website. Many people can't get here for, uh, because of the pandemic. We want to be, make that available for everyone to view. And you can get that on our website by going to uh, mmam.org slash Tony Duran and clicking on the button that says online exhibition. Just so you're aware, some of this exhibition does contain nudity, as you can see right behind me. Um, <laughs> This, uh, this event is free thanks to the generous support of Ernest and Sally Mysek in memory of W.B. Bill Gouch. And exhibition support is provided by the voters of Minnesota through a Minnesota State Arts Board operating support grant thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Now that we got all the business out of the way, I'd like to thank Tony for being with us <coughs> today. Shall we get started? Sure. How are you doing today, Tony? I'm good, thank you. Thank you. Thank All right. You. <laughs> Thanks everybody for taking the time to do this. And hopefully you'll get a chance to get down to the museum. And if not, and check that. Be entertained with this. Right. And, and as, as I said, um, images are available online. So um, if you want to check that out as we go along too, you're welcome to, to head over to our website. Um, I'm just going to jump into some questions that I have. Um, as I mentioned, if you have any other questions uh, that you would like me to ask, pop it into the chat box or hit it in the question section. I will read those off to Tony as we go. Uh, as I mentioned in my intro that Tony is a Winona, Minnesota native um, photographer. He grew up here, um, uh, went to high school here, has, still has family here. So I want to talk a little bit about, uh, start off with your early, some of your early inspirations in your time here in Minnesota and Winona. Um, you were born and raised here. Are, are, what are some of your early influences in Winona that made you want to become a professional photographer? I actually probably didn't know then, back when I lived there or went to high school, because growing up, I actually wanted to be Darren Stevens, which he wasn't a photographer. He was just married to a witch and wanted to be in advertising. So it sort of had something to do with photography. Darren Stevens from Bewitched? Bewitched. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Literally what I wanted to be growing up is which kind of it, I always thought of him when I was a kid he made presentations to Larry Tate his boss and made drawings and did all these things that 
kind of led me into going to school in Eau Claire, Wisconsin for advertising, which then the advertising classes, I took a photography course and that just opened up the door for photography. But I've never really had a background or major interest in photography. It just kind of happened. And so the way Winona growing up was more, um, my mom was very creative. My dad was creative. My brother was creative. Always, I was always in art classes and painting and drawing and whatnot. So that that part of it lent itself to the photography, I think, down the road. And um, sure. right. So you had early creative influences that might not have been specifically photography, but yeah. that was that kind of started here in Winona. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And always, I I actually I remember in like maybe tenth grade or eleventh grade, I used to paint portraits of people. All these girls in my class and they would pay me like 50 bucks or 100 bucks or 75 dollars and I would paint their portrait and that's the way I made money just to kind of get through my friend when I was a kid but sure. I think even to this day like last reunion I went to a couple of girls I talked to still have the same the portrait that was framed in their living rooms or whatever so <laughs> you know it kind of because I went into college doing the same thing painting portraits to make money but then I took the photography course and realized I you know, can take a picture faster than I can paint a picture and therefore the money turnover is faster. And so that's what got me into it kind of. And one of the first people I took a picture of won a modeling contest. And so, oh. yeah, so she, she won the Elite Look of the Year, which was a big modeling contest back in the day. And um, that opened up the door to meet some agents and whatnot. And that's how it all got started. Great. We've had, since the exhibition was announced and, and started um, in January last month, We've had several people contact us or post on social media saying, oh, I still have a portrait that Tony did for me in high school or painted on the high school wall or all, the, all these different things. So, pe so people remember and they still have, they still have their connection to, to Tony Duran. Um, so moving on from your early days here in Winona uh, in, in Minnesota, do you feel that your rural Minnesota upbringing has any advantages or disadvantages working in the highly competitive fast paced industry in Los Angeles? Um, I think, I think the thing I hang on to most through this whole like 20, 25 years is I, I have a really Midwestern upbringing and I, I um, have a really strong work ethic, which has gotten me through a lot, a lot of stuff. Um, and I, I gravitate towards, to be honest, Midwestern people like throughout the industry, which has kept me kind of afloat and kept me grounded versus getting caught up in kind of a lot of stuff, I guess, that you could. Um, it, the work ethic coming from, I was in a swimmer when I was in Winona and growing up and all through college, that, that kind of thinking of, you know, getting up at a certain time, performing on off, on off switch kind of thing through, through swimming kind of has opened up a, a kind of the ability to navigate how to do these jobs. And, um, you have to, it's such an on off business. And I think that was installed in, or in just placed in me when I was young. So it wasn't anything new as I um, went into taking pictures and commercially working all the time. So um, yeah, just, I think I'm, I'm really tight with my family still and I'm always talking to them and it just keeps you grounded because it's tough when you're traveling or if you're in a foreign country or if you're, you know, Hollywood seems like a foreign country to me, you know, and um, you know, it just, it isn't my cup of tea really. And I kind of make my own little world here. And so, um, yeah, I think, I think the Midwest has completely, it hasn't changed. I haven't changed a bit since <laughs> back in college, to be honest. <laughs> it's like, sure. yeah. Well, I know you mentioned to me when we were talking about some of the images in the show, you pointed out every time someone was from Minnesota. So clearly yeah. when you make a connection with someone, that's something that that's important for you. If you yeah. know that from your home state. <laughs> yeah. no, sure. Um, so moving from Winona to California, I'm, I'm curious about that space in between. Um, your life as an artist started here in Winona and you now have lived and worked in California for many years. Where has your profession taken you in between your life in Winona and your life in California? Hmm. No, I've been all over the world. I left, I left Winona probably on a Christmas with garbage bags full of clothes and I moved to New York and said I was gonna, you know, make it there or whatever but I was only there for like two months and I was run over by a bus and so I had to come home and then went to 
Milan on crutches because a Minnesota friend said he was a model who said you should come to Milan that's where photographers come you can live with me and move in and we can you know share rent but then I got there on crutches and he moved to Paris and so I was stranded in Milan but kind of put you know set roots in Milan went from Milan to Greece Greece to Paris back to Greece to Australia back to New York back to Australia back to New York then LA and so I'm trying to think yeah so spending anywhere from six months to a year in every place and starting from scratch in every place and just trying to make a buck and trying to keep it going and build a portfolio to be told that the portfolio wasn't good enough and then go to the next place and hope for the best and start over again. And yeah, so I spent a good call at 10 years like that. So, I mean, that's a long time to be itinerant. Is that, how has that experience, those different perspectives that you've seen around the world, how has that affected your, your work today? It was actually my favorite time of my life. And because it just, you, you don't think so much about what you're doing. You don't worry about money. You're there for the adventure and kind of seeing the country and meeting people. I had, I think before I had my first place on my own, I had 57 roommates is what I think the tally was. And, you know, sleeping on floors and sharing a place with a ton of people. But you just got to know people. And I'm always proud to be able to say, like, I didn't, just go to a country and visit. I actually made a living there and, you know, set up a place to live and worked, you know, daily with the people and stuff. So I got to learn a lot. And, um, I learned like I'm not good in a foreign country like Paris, you know, if I don't speak the language, I feel I get really shy and I don't perform as well. But like places like Australia, I went there for three months and stayed four years. And so it's just, that was my favorite place really. And, you know, and everywhere speaks English, but it, it just isn't the same thing for me because I, I don't speak any other languages, which is kind of sad, but true. <laughs> so. um, before I move on to the next question, we do have more people that hopped on. So I just want to remind anyone, if you have any questions that you would want, feel free uh, to pop in at any time and put those in the chat or in the question section, and I can read them um, as we go. Um, we do have someone, Margaret Klein, who's your English teacher way back when. She is saying hello. <laughs> If you remember Margaret Klein or Kine, sorry, K I I H N E. Oh, Keen. Keen. Okay. Okay. No, because I was like, I will nod and say I know Margaret Klein, but I don't, but I know Mrs. Keeney. She okay. asked, Keeney. We ask of influences. She was one of the biggest influences in my young life. And I think of her often. I just picked up a yearbook because I had, you know, people were emailing me about this and I had to kind of find out, oh yeah, I remember this person, this person, but I think of Miss Keeney, who literally gave me the, the concept of creativity in that you can use your brain to kind of go elsewhere and write things and create and paint and draw. And she, I can see her face right now. Like there's probably <laughs> 10 people in my life and she would be one of the main people in my young life. So there sure. you go. That's just cool. random. I would have said the same about Mrs. Klein. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for jumping on and saying hello. There, I've always wanted to reach back out to her because I, I can think of stories she said, things she wrote during being creative with the yearbook, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh, that makes Great. Sense. Yeah. yeah, that's good to hear. <laughs> she says I'm breathless and she's 83 now. <laughs> that's why <laughs> but, but she knows how to use, use zoom so that's great <laughs> and i don't this is my first zoom. <laughs> <laughs> this is tony's first time yeah. all right moving on i got another question here um uh in the exhibition in uh, both in the video we have here and in the text you talk about your opportunity that you had to photograph singer jennifer lopez and, and you mark this as a pivotal moment in your career how did that opportunity come about and how did it change the, the, the trajectory of your career as a photographer? Um, I was living in New York at the time and in 1998. And at that point I was so broke and poor and owed like seven months rent. And I kind of just gave up and I took a year off and did another job for a year and I kind of committed to another job and I signed on to this job and said, you know, I'll do this for 365 days. You will pay me this much money. You can never use my name kind of thing. I, I worked at an agency. I won't touch a computer. I, yeah, I had all these stipulations, but somebody agreed to it and I did it for a year. And when it was done, 
that next week I made a list and said, if I'm going to get back into photography, I need to find my Madonna, kind of like Herbert's had Madonna to kind of catapult him into a different level. So I did a little research. She had just done Selena, but it wasn't out yet. And I put her on a list and three days later, a friend of mine from Florida called and said, would you be interested in coming to Florida and shoot this young actress, Jennifer Lopez? And I'm like, hell yeah. And I went down and shot her and promised myself I would take great pictures of her. So she calls me, so she would call me back and it happened that way. And that led to like 85 shoots that we've done over 15 years and something like that, 75, 85 shoots. Um, but it was those first shoots, the album cover, that it was her first album. People didn't know she could sing or was even in, in, in music um, just. Oh, oh, never mind. I was, That's I, me, sorry. I, I pull, I I pulled up like, the, this computer is gone. Um, no, but I pulled up, I, I believe you're referring to this photograph would be around that time, right? Yeah, this was right after the album cover. And so this picture was maybe in 2002 or something and um 2003 and it was for a men's magazine like stuff or gq or something and we were just doing a bunch of shots and um i was in the midst of trying to buy a house because i was being kicked out of the house i was renting and um because they wanted to sell it and at that time i didn't have the money to buy a house in it by any means but through taking this picture and resale of this picture and some other things that came along within a very short time, I got a down payment for the house and kind of that picture became a huge thing and ran on multiple, multiple covers and kind of kept paying dividends. So it worked that out, worked the whole house thing out. And ultimately I put a sign on the house, a little metal plaque that said the house that Jennifer built. And that became kind of a, kind of a, Thing about that Bel Air house and you know lots of reporters over the years have asked me and whatnot but um it just it goes to show like how big she was when she started and that 20 years later she's still as big if not bigger in the tenacity and work ethic that she has to kind of keep going but um I learned a lot from that whole experience and also the power of a picture for sure. Sure, and we all and we all saw her on inauguration day singing on the yeah. Capitol, which is great to see. <laughs> yeah, that was crazy. I mean, so. Um, so you often photograph in your own home rather than in studios or on location, and you've you've I know you've bought and and kind of created and sold many homes that are kind of built around um, sh um, shooting or your photography. Can you explain mm -hmm. the benefits of of this setup and how your subjects have reacted to it? Yeah, I mean, it started with that Bel Air house and the goal was I moved from New York and nobody likes being in their house in New York or their apartments. And so when I got this Bel Air house, I wanted to create kind of, um, I always joked and said it was a Warhol West Coast factory, but I always said with prettier people and <laughs> whatever, I don't know. And it, instead of going to studios and renting a studio for $5,000 a day where you're just sitting with four white walls, just create an environment that people come up, there's not a lot of people around, you get to enjoy your time. And, you know, it's just much more comfortable. And people used to, you know, a lot of photographers would poo poo on it and say, oh, you can't do that. But it worked. And it just, it created this memorable day and environment, and you know, many, 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 many shoots of people just, they wouldn't perform the same way if they were in a studio full of people coming and going and whatnot. And also studios in LA, these actors and actresses come and go from the studio every day. And it's the same place. They could show up to the same four white walls. And so it's hard to get kind of inspired or motivated. And in all the places, they weren't really like my homes. They were like kind of locations more so. And my home was really just where I slept or ate. And the rest was always, you know, transforming into another environment, which kind of led me down the path of really enjoying design and interior design and whatnot after all the years. So, yeah. Um, you, you mentioned interior design. Do you want to touch on, so you're, you're here obviously for your photography and your exhibition here at the museum, but interior design and architecture is a big part of your career as well. Uh, do you just want to touch on that a little bit? I mean, I, it's just kind of a segue of where I think I'm going to go in the future is I've shot so much over the 20 years and not, you know, only so much can change. And so I want to keep 
challenging myself and through doing all these different homes I learned a lot about design and then also doing numbers of like interior campaigns furniture campaigns hotel campaigns that kind of thing so it's just kind of going to be a natural I was just saying to my assistant Justin today it's like I just enjoy it so much and I want to just enjoy myself like thinking sometimes of shoots in this day and age not so exciting being so social media driven Instagram driven pandemic driven all that kind of stuff it just starts <laughs> to be not as fun where I'm being inspired a lot by interiors and whatnot and finding ways to combine it all you know and sure yeah so. um kind of speaking to that um and, and shooting at home um, we have a question from Daryl. He says, how do you get a variety for your shoots if you were done in the same location? I have no so idea. Specific your... <laughs> yeah, no, I ask myself every day and I question every, like I'm, I would move from a house after a couple of years because I feel like I did, did it over and over and over again. But ultimately the light dictates what an environment looks like. So depending on when you shoot, I'm always moving subtle things around and I don't include a lot in my pictures. So I get away with a lot, to be honest. And I always have to forewarn people, you know, like even just the picture behind you, Dave, is that's a cardboard box that I painted and I painted a corner wall of a studio of a room while she was getting hair and makeup. It's not, you know. Um... That's me, Tony, go ahead and keep going. I'm oh, just yeah. pulling up the picture for people to see. Yeah, no, and you, um, yeah, it just like, and now see, well, for whatever it's worth, I got gra gra or grabbed a gravel from the alleyway downstairs, a cardboard box she's sitting on and just painting a white wall. So it doesn't matter where you are, you just point the light you know, or whatever, the window light was hitting her. And just throughout the house, houses I've been in, I just create textures. If you want to flip that back, because <laughs> I'm like staring at her. Uh, I, actually, I have a question. I want to pull up this photo. I, I love this photo, and I think this is an example of how you can use a kind of common space of a pool and really just use, you have two reflective oh, yeah. boxes, really makes this into a very interesting photo. And if the makeup artist that was on this job, the groomer, is on this Zoom call, I will beat him because I've worked with him for 20 years. And this is a prime example of just taking the coffee tables from my living room and saying, I'm sure they float, <laughs> and threw them in without asking me. And But then you just go right into the pictures and... That's my assistant's hand that we put fake nails on. Um, <laughs> and it is, it's just exactly that, that that little element can take, you know, I've shot probably, there's probably 10 pictures in the corner of that pool that are in that show that mm -hmm. you're in. You, know, and you just change it up through that. And It's funny that you say that because you, because you look at them, you don't necessarily know the same place, but I noticed some subtle things like the tile yeah. in the pool or the, the grass line or something. So you're like, oh, th these are all, all shot in the same place, but you wouldn't necessarily yeah. know unless you're really, really close to those details. Yeah. Like, you know, where, where the hand is in that picture, there is a picture of Sharon Stone in your, um, the show and, you know, she's just floating around in there, you know, same thing, but it just, it feel, you know, water is water. Everybody, like, I never actually shoot in, in the ocean. Everybody thinks I, I'm always on the beach shooting in water, and I never have even gone in the ocean to shoot, or I rarely go to the beach, just because I'd rather shoot near a pool or just water in general. Like, no, oh, not oh. Any people a bit floating. A little bit off topic, but you mentioned the Sharon Stone photo um, that I pulled up here. Mm -hmm. Oh, I will pull up here. Hold on. Oh, you don't have to pull it up for me. Um, well, let's give the, our, uh, our viewers oh, the, oh, opportunity sorry. to see it. Nope, you're fine. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, it's all about me. <laughs> kind, of off to, kind of off topic, but there's a funny story about when you're uh, shooting this, this photo of Sharon Stone and your mother called. Yeah, no, it, we were just finishing. This was one of the last shoots of the day for Rolling Stone, I think it was. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, that's my, my assistant, a different assistant, holding her up. And we finished the shot, my phone rang, and it was my mom, and she was kind of going on about how her garbage disposal had broken down, and she was kind of pissed off or laughing about it. And then my mom's so polite, and she, she was like, oh, gosh, I'm sorry, are you working? Are you busy? And I'm like, oh, no, I'm just finishing the day. Here, you want to talk to Sharon Stone? And I handed over the phone, and Sharon just said something to her, and, um, you know, just kind of happens that way, and whatever. And I didn't, I had no idea how to fix her garbage disposal and neither did Sharon. So we just moved on and that was that. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> but it's just funny, like that's my shirt she's wearing and you sure. just put on and you know, whatever. 
Um, I've got a few more questions that have popped up from some of our uh, viewers here. So Mary Nelson asks, many of your photos in the museum are black and white. Do you prefer to shoot that way? I used to, for a very long time, I used to prefer black and white. And not until recently, all of a sudden, I'm redoing quite a bit of stuff and during the pandemic working on my archive, I actually appreciate color a lot more than I did. And just the raw, there's been so many phases with photography through digital, through whatnot, and how much you can do in post and whatever, but I'm actually starting to really appreciate just the raw color images I take. But there was a, you know, a good amount of time that if anybody gave me a chance to shoot black and white or print or you know, publish in black and white, I would do it. And so um, it was a, a thing for me for a long time. And it forgives a lot of things too. So sure. it was a better thing for me learning too. And I didn't have as much control over what I was doing. It was much more forgiving. So we, we, you talked about, uh, we we're just talking about the use of water and pools um, at your home there. And I just want to touch on that a little bit. Um, as I mentioned before, it's the mission of the Minnesota Marine Art Museum to engage visitors in visual art experiences that explore the ongoing human relationship with water. Um, while you as an artist do not specifically focus on water in your photographs, water is a common element throughout a lot of your work. Uh, could you explain the ways in which you have in incorporated water into some of your photo shoots? I actually use it a lot more than people think. Um, there's a rare shoot that somebody doesn't get doused in some way, um, either to wake them up or to calm them down kind of thing. One of the two. <laughs> and, also, I shoot a lot with not a lot of makeup, like on women, not a lot of makeup. And it just, everybody just always looks better wet. <laughs> and so it's a good way to start and get pictures going and freshen up and then move into something else. And I've always, all my houses always have pools or, you know, yeah, pretty much. And it's just nice and refreshing and stuff. So I always, it's, it's always part of every shoot in some way or another. And it is a way of, it kind of puts people at their most, um, kind of raw, yeah, like a lot of times just to, you know, dive in the pool before we start shooting or, you know, pour a bucket of water over your head or whatever. It just kind of starts it out in a really raw, fresh space. And then people are much more open to explore because all that kind of artifice and everything is away. And then you go whatever direction you need. So do you think it's just the shock of that kind of it's sometimes it's a shock, mind. sometimes sure. it's a calming. It depends on the person, you know. I've sure. done many times where somebody is just stiff as and just can't get out of their head. And I'll mm -hmm. just be like, here's a bucket of water. I'll turn, find a hose and turn it on and just spray, you know. It's just, it can work either way. It can calm them down or wake them up or any of the above. But it, and in, in any way, it changes the direction where sometimes I just need the kind of the energy direction to change. And so. Sure. So during the shoot itself, it serves one purpose, but in the final product of the photograph, is there an element that you feel like water adds? It, it's funny, because as I said, I rarely shoot, because you, as you can see, Sharon Stone is being held up. Like people don't mm -hmm. look good floating in water. Like it's not, <laughs> it's not the easiest thing to do. And I've looked at that, I've looked at that photo hundreds of times now that you, you, it's the first time I've noticed she's being held up. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's, no, because yeah, you don't just kind of levitate there. <laughs> and so. Sure, no, but I think that speaks that it's a good photo. It looks like she's levitating there. Like, you <laughs> fooled me, you know, it looks like yeah. she was floating in the water in, in some yeah. odd way. But now that you point that out, of course, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, because I, like, the only, in Australia, I used to, like, rarely go shoot out in the ocean. And I would just swear the whole time and just be like, mind my language, but how the you know, does Herbert Stewart shooting out in the ocean, but he never did. He shot from the beach and la la la. I'm out in the ocean in the waves thinking this isn't working out. It's like you have no control people are being pulverized. You're worried sure. about your camera. And so, sure. so pools are always helpful in the shallow end and, you know, whatever. But um, I shoot in a lot of bathtubs too and weird, like, and bathtubs have changed so much over the years. And so it kind of incorporates into the architecture part and stuff. And I don't know. I just, people enjoy being in water, <laughs> you know, it calms them down. And so, yeah. Really? Yeah. Um, kind of related to that. You mentioned how the water calms people. Uh, Margaret, uh, your former teacher, Margaret asks, how do you bring an actress or star, or how do you bring an actress or star to feel comfortable or relaxed during a shoot? Um, that's asked a lot. Um, 
I think because I'm so straightforward and I've shot so many people over all this time and an actor, an actress or a model or a person, it doesn't make a difference. Most people are insecure having their pictures taken and people don't understand like an actor, they're used to getting direction, you know, moving through a scene, speaking. So still picture makes them very nervous. So it's just sitting down right away and not, you know, not dancing around it. And it's like, what are your insecurities? What are you worried about? How, you know, and then digital has made it very good because you can, I can take a picture very quickly and turn the camera around and say, see, you look good. And that's all they need to see is, sure. you know, that you're, that they're not, because it's very vulnerable. Like it's a, it's a weird, I would never be able to do it in, but I think I have that empathy that I would never do it. So I understand they must be kind of nervous about it. And it goes for men and women. Men are worse. Women are used to being looked at. Men are worse, like as far as feeling insecure and stuff like that. So there's, it just have to talk and get to it really fast. Don't take too much time. And I don't light anything. So there's no time just sitting, waiting, setting light. I just jump right into it. You know, nine times out of 10, I have a shot within the first three minutes of the shoot starting. And so, sure. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you often get your, your, the photo you want very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to pull up one picture of Mickey Rourke. Mm -hmm. I believe you have an interesting story um, about how that photo came about. And that was came up pretty quickly. Am I, yeah. am I right on that? Yeah. yeah. I mean, let, me pull, let me pull that up if you want to tell that story. Where is it here? There he is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, he came to a house that I called my Ledgewood house, which was right below the Hollywood sign. And we were shooting the cover of, um, I think, Flaunt magazine. And he got there and kind of was trying to figure out what we were doing and wondering what the styling was and kind of just had a lot of questions. But at the same time, there was also a shoot because he had to do two shoots at once. And because he came to my house to shoot, the other photographer was upstairs getting set for another shoot with him. So kind of had a lot on his mind, I think, and was trying to figure out, you know, the styling direction, everything. And I just sat there with Justin, my assistant, and watched him kind of go through things and question things, lots of questioning. And I just kind of made a little joke saying, you know, I can get a cover in three seconds if you just let me, if it doesn't matter what you're wearing, all you have to do is sit in good light. And he just kind of silenced and was like, you know, almost like I dare you to and <laughs> got him down and took this picture in like three frames. And I said, yep, that'll be the cover for sure. And he laughed and thought, you know, hey, I was probably an idiot, but kind of went with it and we had a really, great day shooting and um, this ended up being the cover and it was, you know, just that quick and easy. And we got it. It's a great shot. <laughs> yeah, no, and he was a really cool guy. It was fun. Good. Um, another question from a participant here, uh, Kathy Christensen asks, uh, your humor is visible in these photos. Do you make, you make, uh, you make this look fun instead of like work? Um, do your f subjects feel the same? Do you feel like you make them have fun? I try to, and that's the big issue now is after all these years, I want to have fun and just enjoy the process, but it's become such a business in on all levels from everybody's point of view and everybody's a brand and everything's a moment and everything's documented, everything. So a lot of the fun has gone out where I remember like doing a cover of Rolling, or what was I working with? Yeah, doing Rolling Stone for something else and the Rolling Stone editor talking about a what the shoots used to be like before my time and they would go and shoot for two weeks like well yeah i was doing a tom cruise shoot and they would go and shoot for two weeks and pick some pictures and you know go and stay at great hotels and this and that where my rolling stone cover with tom cruise i had 45 minutes front to back him walking to set and leaving and it just you it's changed so much and then it's changed exponentially now and but i want to have fun. like it Yes, I've had, I have fun. I try to, I make fun of myself the whole way through. That's what I learned in Australia. It was a very self-deprecating humor. Um, and just put people's guard down, like, cause you, you know, and, and I'm good at what I do. Like, I, I, I understand that. And so if I can do it fast and keep everybody entertained and that's the other part of being at my house too. It makes it fun, have good food and stuff and just enjoy the process instead of it being work. 
And so, yeah. Sure. That, that's, that's hard to do when you only have 45 minutes. <laughs> well, it, it starts to be, yeah, it's a bit of a clown show. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> like, you're like not Everyone's sure when to turn it on and you're, only, you're, you're looking at your watch, but okay, I gotta, I gotta crank this up a little bit. So it's, it sure. changes its, its kind of um, intensity, I guess, because you're all of mm -hmm. a sudden come out of nowhere. There's no build up. It's like, sure. yeah. but I think that takes a lot of experience and skill to be able to, you know, let have someone let their guard down and get a good shoot in such a short period of time. Yeah. And also just my, my nerves getting my, you know, when you're sitting in front of some of these people and it's not even so much the, the actual actors, it's the publicists and the managers and the behind the scenes people and the whatever, you know, that's this part that people don't actually think about because truth be known, the Brad Pitts of the world are the nicest people and easy to work with. And that's why they're still around, but it's just, yeah, you know, there's a lot of people on set sometimes. And so I've been trying sure. for years to kind of weed that out. So. Sure. And actually, someone just popped in with the question, where to go? Um, do celebrities often arrive with large crews, stylists, um, things like that? And is, it, can they be, is that an interference? Um, what I've found over the years is the big ones don't. Like when I say big, like uh, Brad Pitts and, um, you know, Sh Sharon. Sharon just rocked up, like, to my house and then she called friends because she was having fun so she called friends to come up and hang out <laughs> not like <laughs> or anything all all the major major ones they know what they're doing they whatever but it's it's typically the newest actors and actresses who come with their best friend their publicist their manager their publicist publicist their dog their stylist dog the stylist the dog of the stylist you know it just it's absurd the amount of people mm -hmm. it's usually the people who can't afford to have all those people <laughs> and it, it's just a weird thing but you know somebody like a brad or whatever just rocks on set and is ready to work and they know who they are and they they know where they are so they, they're in control of it so that's good sure yeah uh kind of related so uh, mary nelson asks if you if you provide clothing and props for the shoot or the subjects come with their own crew um I tend to work with my own crew because the how fast I work and the style of photography, or you know, I or I have a list of kind of stylists and people that just can work under because people are expecting to get my pictures and it's very difficult if you're working with people who don't work that way. So that's always been kind of an up and down issue along the way. But it people have been really flexible with me over the years and but now even now like I spend a lot of shoots just going out and finding clothes myself or finding designers that just give me a rack of clothes and just go play. And this pandemic has actually helped in that because I think what's going to come out of this is people are going to be used to not having that in still being able to perform and understanding that you actually can get a lot more done. And so sure. hopefully that will be the change. Well, I have two more questions that popped up that kind of you just touched on a little bit. Um, so I'll go ahead and ask them. Kathy asks, assuming, uh, assuming you come to a shoot with an idea of what you want to do, how do you get everyone on board to complete your vision? You beg, then you <laughs> beg more, and then you change your mind. And then you are flexible and come up with something completely different. Or you, it just is a crapshoot. And you can, nothing ever seems to go the way it's supposed to. So I rarely plan shoots, even the biggest ones that I think feel planned, you come in, I come in with tons of flexibility because you just don't know the subject, you know, what the day was for them the day before, what they're, you know, and I don't want to expect, you know, I never tell people you have to be in this character, be this, I'm, I'm very flexible in that way, but um, you do your best to explain it. And, um, but most of my, most of my shoots are really organic and I make them up on the spot and it may not seem like that, but um, I kind of do. <laughs> sure, you mentioned the, uh, the the coffee tables thrown in the pool. The, the yeah, like <laughs> I'm sure that wasn't planned out ahead of time. No, not at all. <laughs> so, and most is just most of the things aren't. You know, there can be a general sure. direction, but you know, even the angel wings in the back that wasn't supposed to be that anything like that that day. Mm -hmm. She just decided she wanted to do that, and so we made it happen. And so true. Um, you touched on this a little bit in the last question too, but Julie asks, during the ongoing pandemic, have you been able to work? And um, she says, I'm not familiar with how close you are with your subjects while photographing. Are you having to wear photos or take photos of subjects and masks? So just how has is, how is life in the pandemic worked for a, 
it, a, a photographer. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a rotten business to be in for this <laughs> during this because the reality of all of that is exactly that. What can you do? Because it's all about people. You know, and I've noticed a whole stuff, which this is what's going to make me make me afraid of how culture works is, you know, with this going on for a year and it's going to be another six months at least before people even get comfortable, at least it's going to shift how people shoot and what's acceptable in that kind of lack of um, connection, lack of which is through social media and Instagram, the way everything has been going anyway, is there's a very big disconnect in imagery, I, I believe in this year of all this happening and people using that as a crutch that, okay, well, we can't do this. So now this is the way it has to be. I hope it doesn't keep building that way. But for me, you just have to, I haven't worked you know, a ton at all. Like it just has been, because most of my shoots are either bigger and more production or whatever. And we've had to shift completely of how to make, which is something I've been wanting to do anyway, is how to make things people understand you don't need productions, you don't need all this stuff, you just need creativity. And, you know, you get COVID tested before the shoot, but again, it's kind of, it's a tough thing because you could be sure. taking three steps through a room and, you know, so, but you just are as careful as you can be and mm -hmm. everybody wears masks, everybody has sanitizer, you stay away from each other as much as you can. It's just a stylist, makeup artist who really kind of are a hands-on kind of thing. And so, um, yeah, but it, it is, you have to, you know, creative people, you have to work. So you have yeah. to come and get around it and take that risk. I think, you know, your point that the way you, you like to shoot already is a smaller crew, yeah. you know, kind of one-on-one, -on -one, like that that might be the, the best way to do it. So, you know, kind of yeah. moving that direction. I mean, I hope I hope that works out for me in that way because it's been kind of the one of the things because my pictures look produced and they're not. And, you know, I've been working with Justin, my studio manager for 13 years. And I used to have tons of assistants and producers and all that, and I don't have it anymore. And I haven't for a very long time, but people don't look at the pictures and think that. They think there's a lot more to it. So I think hopefully this break in that and the forcing people to understand that, it trickles out, you know? Sure. So. We've got a couple more questions coming in in the chat and I'll get to them, but I wanna to get to a couple of more that I have in my list before we, we hop, uh, do that. So feel free to keep typing. Um, if people have anything more to I add. Feel free to keep typing and I may not answer you. No, we, we may not be able to get to it, but I appreciate, I, I really appreciate everyone jumping on with a lot of questions here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about influences. We have a question that popped up here about influence, which I'll get to, but uh, um, one question I have is, you have an uncanny knowledge about pop culture, fashion and advertising, having spent a lot, you know, many years in that industry. And you seem to be as comfortable in the company of young people as well as older. You see a wide range of ages being shot on your film. Um, are there particular decades of fashion or pop culture that you turn to for inspiration? 80s. Always the 80s. 80s. Everything revolves around the 80s. And it just, and then I don't know because I grew up in that, but I just, because people were like music, everything, they were like, even in America, it was kind of like people like Boy George, Cindy Lauper, Duran Duran, all that. They, they had so many influences and it it was just a good time. There was androgyny, there was like Lower East Side, cool, there was grunge, there was all these different things. And people, when you would go to the Grammys or something, there were so many different people. And now it just, it feels like everybody looks like everybody and is being the same thing and whatnot. And, um, fashion was so tacky and cool and that's what fashion should be I think and now <laughs> fashion is like sweats and wearable and gross and so I don't know yeah 80s but I love like I love every like I pay attention to everything from 20s 40s 60s whatever as far as fashion and architecture and things and try to mix I hope in my pictures down the road there's such a mix of things that it isn't of any decade it, it's just kind of timeless or whatever that's my goal Thing. So, sure. um, many of your commercial work feature idealized body types and lifestyles. The last couple of years we have seen advertisers more willing to embrace all body types and abilities. How has this a trend uh, affected your work? I mean, it hasn't in a sense of I've been doing that for years. I mean, just start with Jennifer Lopez. She was considered 
a plus size girl when we started, you know, and it's like insane to me. Like right now it, it is, people are kind of jumping on that bandwagon and it becomes a little pandering to me, but my whole career, black, white, green, doesn't matter, androgynous, boy, girl, guy, older, younger, any size. I just want confidence and that there will always be, and this is something I kind of am grappling with right now is there's such a reality based culture right now where to me, anything I do, I want to slip into non-reality. What, cause to me, what's the fun of everything just looking as it is. Cause then there, I don't know, there's no fantasy in it. There's no creativity as far as I'm concerned, like my, in my opinion. So I always like to heighten whatever I'm doing, um, be it just a simple portrait or um, the way I shoot a room with the way, you know, anything, I just want to heighten it. So in, so it doesn't really matter what or who I'm shooting, it'll always come out kind of heightened and stronger and whatnot, where right now the trend is to show people and things in the most common, relatable way possible. And I just don't think I'll ever fall into that category, but just it has nothing to do with casting or nothing to do with the, t the subject. It's just the style I shoot. Sure. Yeah. And yeah, you'll, you'll, you would project your style on whomever you were shooting. Well, it's, it's on um, anybody. Yeah. And right. Anything. Right. Yeah. right. Um, okay. Uh, kind of two part questions here. Do you have any experiences that might surprise us about how difficult it is to work in Hollywood? And do you have any advice for anyone that might be interested in becoming a, a celebrity or Hollywood uh, photographer? Um, I just think any creative job is tough and it's all about confidence, I think, because the reality is it's so subjective and I've never had doubt. I've always felt confident in my work for the most part, but I never to this day don't feel confident it fits in to anything. And that's always been my issue is wrong timing, wrong place or ahead of the game or behind the game or whatever, but it's never been lack of confidence in what I do. And I think it's in a place like Hollywood, but it's no different than Wall Street or any top tier kind of aspirational thing. You just have to work your ass off and you have to give up a lot of stuff and give up just everyday choices that people have or whatnot. I've never spent a Christmas at home. I've never, you know, whatever. There's a lot of things like that. And then just keeping the point of view not letting people's opinions get to you, which has been something, a very Midwestern thing of mine, is I listen to people's opinions. <laughs> and it's like, it can be daunting and then it can break you quite quickly. And you just have to kind of put, you know, blinders on for that part. And um, as far as becoming a photographer, I wouldn't have a effing clue what to tell somebody. I would <laughs> basically say, I guess you have a phone, go for it. You know, <laughs> it's like, cause I, I don't know what people are doing right now. I kind of, it's become such a mass. I think the photograph itself has become so throwaway that it's a shame because everybody documents everything and there's nothing special anymore. And there's no secrets. There's no, there's no intimate things. There's no fantasy or history. It's just, everything is documented. <laughs> and so sure. that, that's the part where, again, trying to make something heightened, you know, in, so I think, well, I think, you know, in general, it'll go through a phase of the next three or four more years of just inundation. And then, you know, I don't know, but I, I dread becoming a photographer right now because the rates would be horrible. You're doing things for nothing as far as a business, I think. Sure. Right. And, um, it's, it's just so many photographers, so many people doing it. And people are willing to take the lowest common denominator in the lowest price to get something done. And it's become acceptable, I think, which is disappointing. And so, yeah, that's tough. tough it's tough for someone that, you know, inspiring to, to have a career that like you've had. Yeah. Um, I have, uh, we have about 10 minutes left here and I have quite a few questions that have come in. So I'm gonna to try to get through um, as many of them as we can, if that's all right. Um, one call came in from Paul that I think is an interesting question. Um, he asked if the, if the photographs of the museum were printed here at the museum, which they were. Um, and 
uh, kind of from the museum side of that, we frequently do that when we work with photographers, with contemporary photographers when we can. We can do have the ability to print in house. So um, we do do that. John works, uh, John Swanson, our curator of collections and exhibitions, works with the artists to get those printed. Uh, but then he asks, as an artist, do you have any reservations about exhibiting photographs when you're not able to view the final product as you're not able to right now because of the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, you would have reservations about every part of it. I totally do and did. And but you have to the fun part when when John and I met to, um, you know, I was home visiting my mom and she talked about this museum and ultimately I met with John and we had a long talk and this wasn't meant to happen right now, but it did. And I thought of it as a challenge more so than um, something that sh I should get all worked up about, but I still got worked up about it. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> and it's like, but I kept having to let go because there's something fun about it not being in so much control and not trying to, to figure out who and what and why. And, you know, basically, you know, you just have to trust and John had a good way of explaining what he was doing and it, it I felt comfortable with it at, you know there were times when I didn't but that's just me and being neurotic and um I think anybody would be you know in that case but um yeah it's it's the whole business you're nuts all the time and so it's like you know, this just another day of uncomfortable and so it's everything is judgmental everything is subjective everybody has an opinion everybody you know so you have to figure out a way to let go of that which i'm trying to right even at this age for sure still trying to because this is a very like um like a pivotal part of my career where I have a lot ahead of me, but I also am at a point where I get to look back and actually pay attention to what I've done, which I've never done in my life. And it took the pandemic for me to do that. And so- Sure, to look back and realize you have a body of work. <laughs> have some stuff in there. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, um, um, I've got a couple of related questions here. Um, first of all, has, is there anyone that you have uh, shot that you were starstruck by? Um, yeah, and let me think, because it's not the people you think, would think, it's always, oh God, let me, let me come back, to, I have to think about that, because, oh, Jane Fonda. Um, can you Jane tell Fonda. the Jane Fonda story, and, and feel free to use the language if we're probably all about <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tell you, there's going to be an F-bomb that's, that's going <laughs> to come out, if, so if you're, if you're sensitive to that, you can mute it or, or, or log off, but I would love to, I'd love if you shared the the Jane, the Jane Fonda story. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it's not even intimidated. It's just, just knowing who she is and what has been and is being and that whatever in, it was at a period after I had open heart surgery and I was quitting for a while and I wasn't sure if I was even going to get back into photography. I've gone through these phases where I just, you know, there's a, I just sometimes don't want to do it anymore. And that was one of the times and a shoot came up with five actresses I could shoot in a period of one or two days, I think. And she was one of them, so I agreed to do it. And I, she was the last person of the shoot. And she just was so, like, she was pushing 80, late 70s, probably 80. Um, and, you know, she just came over to my house in Hollywood and showed up and she just was so engaging and so interesting and you just, it's hard not to look at her and then see 5,000 images in your head of who she is, what movies she's been in, everything. And sometimes, and especially somebody like her, who it's been over decades, where like a, a Brad Pitt was a Brad Pitt to me. Like he is who he is, he looks like he does, but this is somebody who's had a, you know, a 50 year career at that point. And it just, is overwhelming and you're kind of in your living room thinking okay I'm going to be shooting Jane Fonda in my living room and whatever so so it kind of does her head in and she was nothing but amazing and really engaging and she that what Dave was talking about is she asked me back in the makeup room you know okay what would you like the makeup to be and I looked at her and I was just like you're Jane fucking Fonda you wear whatever makeup you want to wear and then as soon as that came out of my mouth I couldn't stop saying it and I kept saying you know Jane fucking Fonda Jane fucking whatever it but it was this was the first picture of the day and maybe within five or eight, six frames and um it just won her trust and we ended up shooting maybe three or four more times and 
I just, you know, really enjoy everything about what she does and just that she spends time in other parts of life and she's very, she's an activist in a lot of ways and, but also she's a movie star and she knows it and she's all of those things. And that to me is cool and very intimidating. You know, I don't worry about just like actors because actors are used to taking direction and that's what they do. But she's so far beyond that, that it kind of clipped me out a little bit. I hit it. You got a great photo out of it. It's it's, it's yeah, no, it's fun. <laughs> uh, kind of kind of related. Someone asked, "Oh, where to go?" Um, sorry, I don't get your name because I don't remember what the question was. But uh, someone asked if there's if you have a list of the if you could photograph anyone. Oh, here we go. Uh, who would you love to photograph that you haven't had a chance to, to yet? Oh, gosh. easy. Melissa McCarthy, um, <laughs> Carol Streep. Um, oh God, Julianne Moore. Um, gosh, uh, there are a lot of people actually. Jennifer Jason Lee. Um, I get the, it's people from all kinds of things too, like um, certain athletes, certain. Uh, that's what I actually want to do in the next six months. Is I said I was going to do this about two or three years ago, even more than that, and I did a little bit, but kind of start approaching people. Like I just did a shoot of um, Leslie Odom Jr. That was just a test for the fun of it. And we went on some rooftop during the pandemic and shot for a few hours. And, you know, it's so cool to see him kind of going from just Hamilton to like the Golden Globes just came out and he's nominated for like six, seven, eight, nine Golden Globes, something like that. And I have all these pictures of him and we've been going through them each day. Like he'll email and say, okay, I have this cover that people want, can you provide the, and it's just been fun in that way and kind of refreshing to me because it's how I started. Like now I don't even think about it, like in the sense of he's probably going to be one of the biggest actors of all next year or whatever. But to me, he was just fun to shoot. And now we have this kind of more one-on-one -on -one relationship versus just being reactive to the environment. So I want to approach just anybody, like I'm obsessed with Melissa McCarthy. Like I would, I've wanted to shoot her for 15 years and it has not, I wanted to shoot her when she was in Gilmore Girls back in the day. And so, I can see your humor jiving well with oh, her. She's just amazing. And so she hosted a party for, I think it's in the show too, like the guys in high heels. Mm -hmm. There was a book launch party here in LA and she hosted it because her, one of her great friends is the shoe designer. And so I got to know her through him and another person. And she's just amazing. And to me, she's the epitome of how to deal with Hollywood and just... I think what she's done is amazing. And so, um, and she's beautiful. And I just think she's, and she's funny as fuck. And so, <laughs> it's like, and I think like funny people, I enjoy, and then to kind of twist that a little bit and take it a different direction. Um, yeah. Justin, is there anybody else I think of that I'm not thinking of? <laughs> that was a little bit on the top of the list. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, Jody Foster, I would kill the shoot. Sure. Um, yeah. A uh, couple, couple more quick ones here before we sign off. Uh, first of all, um, Catherine commented she loves that the uh, the videos that they added so much to the exhibition, which I agree. Thank you for working with us on those. Those videos are great, which you can find on our website. Um, but then she asks, could you share the story behind the Brad Pitt photo? And then she says, discount question <laughs> mark. I'll pull up the photo. Um, so people can see what we're talking about here. Maybe I'll pull up the photo. Let's see, where's Brad, where's Brad? There he is. What's the story behind this photo? 20% off. It, it was when I think he was doing Fight Club and um, he just was making, it was also, I have to do the timing, but there was a period of time where like there was this, maybe 9-11, I don't, I can't remember, but our, our society was not in good place financially. And it was broken in the news or something that he was making $20 million a movie. And he's the one like, when he showed up for this shoot, there was no PR, maybe a PR for a little bit, super chill, just drove up, so easy going, whatever. And, just wasn't into you know, all the fashion of it and all that. He just was very easy to shoot. And we were just sitting by a bunch of rack of clothes. And he's like, yeah, I don't really need to wear those or whatever. And so I just gave him my shirt, my thermal. 
And from one of the suits that were on the rack, there was that 20% off thing. And I just tacked it on and I said, it's time you like lower your price a little bit if you're going to be at 20 million bucks. <laughs> and just made a joke of it. And he just stood there like that. And it's, it was just a super quick picture because we ended up getting a ton, ton, ton that day. But um, it just is so simple. And it's, he's not one to, he doesn't photograph a lot. Like he doesn't take a lot of pictures over as many years as he's been as big of an actor he doesn't shoot a lot and he typically shoots with specific photographers. So it was such a like honor to be able to do this and that he was so easy going about it. And yeah, so it was a fun day. Sure. That's great. Let me see if we've got anything else here we want to touch on. Um, well, I think that Brad Pitt story is a perfect example of why I'm glad you were able to come here today, Tony, because there's a lot of insight behind these photographs. They're great photographs and we are familiar with a lot of the subject matter from movies or, or TV or, or music or whatever, but it's the, your stories that you can put behind the photographs that, that I really um, am glad that we were able to do this with you today. Um, I know I left a couple questions um, left there, but I think we, we touched on a lot of those topics, topics that you're asking about. And we're at we're just over an hour here. So I want to respect- Can I ask a question? That. I don't even what, know how that works. Like, you can ask a question before I go. Yeah, or if I asked a question, would they be able to answer? Like, on a, yes Certainly, no? yeah. If people want to hop in and answer the questions, go ahead. Get off your lazy ass and answer this question. <laughs> it's a, all right, Tony, it's my, all right, participants, Tony's got a question for you. So get your fingers <laughs> ready. No, it's just it's <laughs> always been, because I've, I've I've always been a photographer under the radar, no PR, no anything. I don't promote myself, all that. So I've never had an idea of what people look at in my pictures. And I'm not be, like trying to be specific, but is it the draw of celebrity or is it the way I take a picture kind of thing that is what engages you? I don't know how people, maybe A or B, but it'd be just interesting because I don't even know how many people are on here or whatever, but I've never been able to really ask that question because any time I publicly spoke it's been such a big thing or you know whatever and it's always derivative of celebrity or whatever so it seems like the focus is always on that so but the question being is it the actual photo or is it the celebrity behind it as far as the bigger draw uh, we've got uh, the way you take the picture the way you take the picture and capture personality um, someone said the way you take the picture um, hungry, the way you take the picture, the lighting and the props specifically, uh, definitely the composition and what draws a person in. Wonderful humanism. You capture the spirit, their spirits in the photo, which I, I would agree. Um, it's the way you take the picture. Uh, the way, then the person, but the way first. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the way the photo is taken, your process. Um, I like the surreal look and the style. There always seems to be a story. One thing I really like is that you use black and white. I feel it is underutilized. Very unlike other photos of them, they're more artistic. How you seem to capture the feeling on someone's face. The way you make the subject comfortable. Hi, Tony, for me, it's the story and your perspective. Thank you. Um, Alessandra says the beauty of the composition in light the black and white shades of gray, use of light. Emily asks, what strikes, oops, uh, what strikes me is the abstract creation of a mundane setting. Hmm. Um, I steal that? Element, <laughs> what's that? You can steal that, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, an element of drama comes through. Uh, John says the glamour and the fantasy of it. Um, John Swanson mentions to me, and he you know, is a trained photographer, John Swanson, our curator here. Um, he always is, is fascinated about the, the, uh, how symmetrical your work is. Like the, the center point is, is dead center every time. And he's, he comments how impressed he is uh, seeing that in, in all his photos. And constantly you call, come over to the computer with the aperture and you're like, look, <laughs> center every time, every time, every time. <laughs> Uh, so technically, I think uh, uh, beyond the subject matter, technically, I think there are very nothing. Um, you, you you work quickly, but it's it's clearly thought out. I think was what what John is getting to that. No, but that, that just the response you read there that's surprising to me. And people, when I, that's really there wasn't a mention of because I've lived in this kind of fog that it's all based on celebrity. And, sure. Yeah. So no, that's yeah. Very 
And yeah, we get another one coming. Beauty, uh, beautiful images. The star power is a bonus. Mm -hmm. And I think you know our much of our audience. That I would imagine much of your audience that's participating here, and I recognize a couple of the same names. They're regular museum goers, mm -hmm. so they're here to look at the art first. Yeah. Yeah. And what's in the photo is is secondary to that. So uh, this is an art loving audience, and so I would take those, those comments that, that that they have to heart. No, and that's why that's why I wanted to do this. It's like an experience to see it from a different perspective. Sure. About that. Yeah. Well, do you have any other questions you want to ask before we go? <laughs> how, how do you do a baked potato? Is it like at four hundred or no? Sorry. I, I think I Google it every time <laughs> I have to make a baked potato. Run <laughs> <laughs> it for an hour, poke a hole in it. <laughs> I know exactly. Somebody started <laughs> shooting the tin poke the hole in it. I'm like, oh, that's too long. <laughs> Well, thank you, Tony, and thank you for all of our attendees uh, for joining us tonight. Um, if you haven't had a chance, come on, check out the music, um, the exhibition. Like I said, we're open um, every day except for Monday from 10 till 5, and the online exhibition is on the website. You can check out all the photos, video, and text that are on there. We have a lot of people saying thank you, and I appreciate their time coming in. Oh, no, and thank you, Mrs. So. Keeney, for being, saying yes, so. Yes, thank you, Mrs. Keeney. Thank you, your lobster arrived, so there you go. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very Thank you, much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.